please welcome our speaker tonight, Mark. Hi, I'm Mark Hudson, alcoholic. Addict. Hey. Um, thanks for inviting me down here. Um, I don't get an opportunity to speak very often because not too many people trust me. Because, <laughs> you know, it's unfortunate. You, know, you have a face like this. It's like I've had oral sex with a bag of Skittles. <laughs> the, the colors is like, it's all, it's, uh, who's that guy? And, you know, fingers are pointing. But, you know, hey, I'm having fun with my face. What can I tell you? Um, I'm here. <laughs> I'm here to tell, I actually like that one myself, I, I think. I, I'm here to, to tell my story. And, and it actually, you know, when I look at my own life, it, it really goes between like the, the darkest spot anyone can go and then maybe the lightest. And the problem with my life is I never found the middle ground. And that's always been it for me. Couldn't just have one stick of gum, I needed the whole pack. It was all, that's the story of my life. And that's how I started. So, let's back up. I was born Italian family. Yay. Yeah, it's good. I'm a paisan. Yeah. Hey, what are you gonna do? And I mean, and, and when you grow up in an Italian family, you're not breastfed. It's wine in your mom's tit. And it, and it's and the whole family. All my aunts had mustaches. Everybody was constantly throwing food. It just it was this thing that was so much fun. It was tough to figure out where the dysfunction was because there was so much love and dancing and swearing and eating and throwing things. It was difficult to understand where it got bad. Okay, so. I was in a family, three brothers, real close in age. Just my mom, just like, boom, one, two, three, we were out. My dad, when I was, and, and the first part of the story is a bit tragic, but it does get worse and better, so stay with me. Um, the, I was five and a half years old, and my dad was uh, this sort of, you know, Italian stallion. I didn't really know him well enough to know the dynamic of what goes on between a husband and a wife. And one night... He came to me, and I was the middle brother, too. The, you know, the older brother always got the new clothes. My younger brother was a porkadelic, so he always had to have... So I, all of my clothes were sort of... And maybe why I'm full, so filled with color now, because the older brother got the new clothes, bright and shiny. The porkadelic brother had to get huskies because he was so big, and I got sort of the faded stuff. So maybe the, I overreacted and became like Rainbow Man as a thing of accident. That's self-diagnosis. And my, my, my dad... My dad came to me, and, and he had this clock, and it was one of those big, old-fashioned clocks with the bells on it, you know, the old alarm clock. And he said to me, Marco, I want you to wake me up at 5.30 in the morning. And I stood there with this clock, and I was five and a half years old, and I thought, Dad, Papa, you want me to wake you up, not the older brother, not the porkadelic? You're asking me, the middle child, Marco. And he went, wake me up at 5.30. And I thought that was the coolest thing in my life, that I was picked as the middle child. And I was sort of a quiet kid also. You know, my nose was this size from a toddler and I grew into it. So I, I, was, it was, I was scary to look at with a skinny neck and it was, it was pretty fucked up. And he said, wake me up. So I, I had the clock and the three of us slept in these beds that were right next to each other, like the three bears. And I was in the middle bed and I put the clock under my pillow and like slept with it because I thought this was the coolest thing in the world. 5.30 comes along, alarm goes off. And my head goes crazy, and I get to wake up my father. And I woke him up, and that was the day that he walked out on my mother and my brothers and I. And so 5.30 in the morning, I wake him up, and I go downstairs, and I see my mom crying, and I see his suitcase, and I see this buffangul, and my dad walks out of my life. And I didn't know what I had done wrong, but for the next... 40 years, almost 40 years, I blamed myself for being the, the reason that this guy walked out of my brothers and my mom and changed our lives completely. And that was the subtext of what ended up happening. So that's, it, that was pretty tragic for me, and I didn't even know as a kid what that meant. So I went right back to the family, the ants with the mustaches, people throwing food, everybody dancing, and I was surrounded by so much love in my family that I didn't really miss a father figure, at least not yet. I would see my mom sometimes, you know, and obviously we went downhill on welfare, you know, spam and powdered milk was my 
my daily. We had spam everything, spam milkshakes, spam omelets. <laughs> I just spam. Even now, when I hold my cross up whenever I see spam, just for that reason. And I can remember like seeing my mom cry. And I was just a young kid. And I'd peek my head around the corner, and there would be my mom with her head in her hand with like change and money, and I'd watch her cry. And, and I didn't know what that feeling was either, other than the fact that it was killing me as a young boy seeing his mother do that. So I would go in and say, hey, mom, watch this. And I'd make a noise, you know, hot, hot, hot. And she'd go, oh, honey, and she'd start laughing. Or I'd slip and do some sort of routine, and she, and she would stop crying. So already I was this young kid trying to be the man in the family and failing miserably and also knowing that it was because of me that my father left, so I'm thinking. Uh, Italian, Catholic, all of the guilt was there. You know, had to go to the father and son dance with the parish priest, and it was that kind of life. So, getting older, I learned how to hate my dad because he never showed up again. Never saw him again. And then, you know, finally, like later on, when I did end up doing a television show and becoming, you know, semi-famous, my dad showed up with my fake name. Because, you know, we changed our name from Salerno, which is my real name, to Hudson. Because we thought that the Salerno brothers sound like you should be shot out of a cannon or <laughs> juggling. <laughs> yeah, it really was, you know. And, and the thing is, you know, it wasn't hip to be an Italian to after The Godfather. You know, prior to that, we were just wise guys, Guinea, Dago, Wop. And all of a sudden, The Godfather, it's, you know, Al Pacino and De Niro, and they're all humping girls against doors. It became hip to be an Italian. So I changed my name too soon. So it, en it, en it ended up that my life stayed pretty normal. The love of my, my mother was my entire reason for my existence. She had the sense of humor. She was a, a beautiful woman, and she knew what she was doing. And so I owe my life, even though it got dysfunctional and completely screwed up, to my mom, and I still do to this day. So the first thing we do is, is my brothers and I become petty thieves because it's all, of, all of the things that end up making me a hopeless alcoholic and drug, drug addict started at this age. So we'd go to the store like three wise guys and go, hey, look over there, and they'd look and we would steal fruit. And one time we stole so much fruit and vegetables and put them down our pants, we looked like John Holmes. Just, we looked like a horn of plenty. Our entire front regions were surrounded with fruit. And we got, this will make sense in the end. I know you're looking at me like the RCA dog now, but it'll make, it will make sense. And we get busted by the cop, Officer Tony, who knew my mom and grew up with her. Grabs the three of us, come on, and took us home. And the three of us are there, still with our pants stuffed with fruit and veg. And all of a sudden, my mom looked up. My mom was famous in the neighborhood for this muffled scream. She'd always look through the curtain and see us doing something horrible. And you would hear, <laughs> my mom thinking that we were. And she sees us standing there with a the cop, opens the door and goes, oh my God, have my sons been shot? Are they all right? And Officer Tony went, no, Eleanor, you know, the boys were down at, the, uh, at Kino's and they were, they were robbing, uh, you know, they were stealing stuff. And she went, my sons would never do anything like that. Bafangul, mushurakatafangul, in Italian to him. And he goes, well, uh, you know, Eleanor. And he points down to our crotches. She looks down and just sees this stuff. And she goes, they wouldn't do that. They're just tired. <laughs> And even we looked, I, even I looked at my mom like, what the fuck does that mean? <laughs> We're just tired, just go to your room and go to sleep. And, and so I didn't know what that meant. I said like, uh, you know, Officer Tony, you want the fruit back? And he went, no, I don't think so. He didn't want to say. So we end up going back to, so my mom's denial was that I was allowed to do any, I could have been an ax murderer. And she just would have gone, he just needs a nap. Go to sleep, because there we were, caught red-handed thieves, but the denial of my mom was the thing that also made me believe later on that there was nothing that I couldn't do that I was supposed to get in trouble for, or that was wrong. There was no boundary I couldn't cross, because my mom just said, if I took a nap, it would all go away. Okay, and you gotta love her for that alone. She's heavily sedated now in Oregon, but that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother meeting. The, Okay, so as it goes on, that happens. We, you know, the Beatles come along, my brothers and I, we start a band, things start working, we start going out and playing, and things start to happen. And as soon as you do that, everything is free. The girls are free, the drugs are free, the, the good times are free, everything was there for us. And we started to exploit 
all of that and take advantage. And because we were brothers and so close, we could work a room like you didn't even know. You know, one brother would weep, the other brother would say, oh, come to Uncle Mark. And it just was this whole routine, like a carny routine almost. And that's when the drinking started. And as I was singing, I would go, oh, well, my throat's kind of scratchy. So we were in Canada, and I got to take Benelin with codeine. And next thing you know, my throat would scratch 98 times a night, and I was <laughs> drinking codeine to the point where I got blasted on it. Now, I got busted by the cops. They sent me back over the border, and I had to go to an AA meeting. Now, this, at this point, it was 1969. I didn't even know what that was. And I walk into a meeting, and there's four guys with no teeth, who, and out of the four, three of them had been arrested for murder. So I, I was walking in with like long hair and platforms, and they thought, they must have thought, who is this fruit? And, and, and so it, I tried my best, but it didn't work. I lasted five times, and at that point, I was too young, I was cocky, I didn't believe that I needed, that I needed this stuff. So I left, went back, back on the road, the lifestyle kept going, but, but my drinking and my drugging was never a problem for me. I just kept going and going and going. Okay? Fine, I would say, you know, no problem. Next thing you know, out of the blue, we get a television series. And for being those guys that were like rocking and rolling, all of a sudden overnight, household name even went one step further into the depths of alcoholism and drug abuse. And still with my mom thinking that I could do nothing wrong. So consequently, it just would be women every day, drugs every day, partying every day. It didn't make any difference. It didn't make any difference because, you know, we had fame. We had everything going for us. And the one thing that I didn't have was a heart and a soul. And I had everything else, but I did not have a heart and a soul. If I would have been on my own, I probably would have died. But I had a brother on either side. You know, I had older brother Bill and the porkadelic brother who had thinned down by then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I take that back because he's very, he's a cute kid. You know, I love my brother and I wish I could be like him now because he wears like a utility belt and has screwdrivers and stuff. He's very available. <laughs> and, and it's just, a, it's, it's great. And I know this, I, I just sort of went to another land every second, but I'm a nice bunch of guys. It takes a while for me to focus. And, and so we end up doing all these, all these TV shows. We're hanging out with famous people. Now and then, you know, I'm in a bath, I'm in a hot tub naked with Sissy Spacek. Yes! I'm thinking I died and gone to heaven. But you know, so I, I didn't remember it. So, I, it, it, so much of it was, the situations were set up, but I started to forget everything that was important to me. The songwriting was still happening because I would still, you know, take psychedelics or whatever and lyrics would come flowing out and blah, 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 blah. Then I met a woman. I was in London. And I met a woman and fell hopelessly in love. And as soon as I saw her, I said, this is my wife. So I sort of cleaned myself out and straightened myself up just so I could be romantic. It wasn't, I, I was missing the partying and I was missing all that other stuff, but I cleaned myself up because my heart actually had something pounding in it and it was love for the first time in my life. And I saw her and I knew this was like the mother of my children. And the worst part about it was she was English. So it was like, oh, hello, Mark. And I'm going, hey, forget about it. So the combination, <laughs> the combination of her sort of Margaret Thatcher, you know, it, it was weird. And even though I'm a peaceful man, you know, I go between Gandhi and Gotti. So there's no middle ground for me. It's either really like, oh, hello, everybody. Oh, I'm going to fucking kill you. And I, and I had problems with my relationship from the very beginning, but I loved her so much I thought I could change. And the thing is, I, I changed my behavior, but not my habits. So here I was with this woman that I loved completely. Next thing you know, we get married. Mother of my children, I love her like nothing else. But I go back to the only thing I knew how to do, which was anything that I wanted to do and not be held accountable for it. Um, as the... As the as the relationship went on, now I don't mean to sound cynical about relationships and stuff, but you know, I'm like the king of broken hearts. And it's a little bit weird for me, because when you get married, that, was, that, first, that, that, that first moment is so great because it's so much love and, and so much sex. And then by the time you're married for three years, like sex only happens on your birthday or if you're gambling with your wife. And that's, that's how I ended up, but again, she was English, they're not known for breeding. I should have married an Italian. It, I'm sorry if there's any English people here, but they're just not, you know, they, they're just not. Oh no, one child in your, I'm sewing it up, and that was it. She puts, she just spackled up, she put spackle down there, and I never saw it again. And, 
<laughs> you know, sometimes I crack myself up because I don't really know. And, but, but, I, but I still loved her. That was the thing, you know, I, I still was like hopelessly in love with this woman, but my behavior still didn't change. And next thing you know, as that went on and the frustration started happening, you know, the brothers broke up and I was on my own. Here comes the fear again, separation. My brothers kind of like kicked me out because of my behavior. And next thing you know, there I was left again by my brothers. And there I started that spiral that happened to me from when I was that young boy. I'd go in the basement, I would drink, quaaludes. I was a downer guy, because look at my personality. This is like 13 years sober. Just imagine how fucked I was when I was using. This was scary to me. So in this case, I, 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 would take, I was a downer guy. Jägermeister and quaaludes, you know, two and all, you name it. It was just how down as I could get. But I started resenting my wife. And I started not being there for my kids, which as an Italian, you love more than anything. At that point, I started caring only about me and my behavior. And then one night, I was out with an Italian girlfriend of mine named Gail Esposito, and she goes, hey, Marco, why don't you try this? It's called Absolute. And I went, absolutely what? Next thing you know, I drink like eight of these, because they went down so smooth, I was just like, it was like Gatorade. Whoa, these are great, Gail. And then I, and I swear to God, the next thing, if it were like a movie, it went black, and it, when it came back again, I was in the ocean, up to my waist with my shirt ripped, yelling at Neptune. <laughs> Neptune! And, and then all of a sudden I went like, boing! And like reality went, whoa! And I looked at myself and my shirt was open, I had salt washing on my jelly sack, and I went, wait a second, it's 6.30 in the morning. Like I never went home, I was completely moist with salt, yelling at Neptune, and I had to go home. Now how do you explain this to your British wife? You're a bastard. Yes, I understand that. But, <laughs> And, and, and no matter what, she would never, like, you know, maybe if she would have bludgeoned me with a heavy object, it would have made more sense to me, because that's what I was used to. But it always was this very sort of stoic Margaret Thatcher, you're covered in salt. Yes, I know that. <laughs> I don't know what happened, Wendy. What do you mean? And so I was on the couch for, like, you know, eight months after that. <laughs> I kept going, it kept getting worse and worse and worse. Uh, the money started going. My friends started going. My career started going. Everything about me was crumbling in front of my very eyes. And I still didn't believe or didn't want to know that nothing could save me. And then one day, I was going to go to my studio for whatever reason, and my wife hugged me goodbye. And when she held me in her arms, I knew that she was getting rid of me. And I know, I know that sounds kind of cosmic, but when, when she held me and said, oh, goodbye, darling, I knew from that moment forward that I was taillights, gone, toast. And that day, as I was at my studio, I was served with papers and I was devastated. Um, I kept drinking. That didn't stop at all. You know, at that point, my love and my lust was all alcohol and, and drugs. And even though I was dying inside, because I lost my family. And the thing is, you know, I love my kids so much. You know, I was a hands-on father. I used to watch them sleep. And I'd go in there and say, I was that kind of dad. And all of a sudden, I was removed from my house. And I didn't, the part of me that was still in denial would not get an apartment. So I lived in my studio where there was no air conditioning, no shower, no TV. I was just living there where I make my music because I thought if I got an apartment, that would mean that I was sort of legally out of my family's life. So like my mother, I was in denial of that. So I lived there, so I'd always have to go home to change my clothes, or maybe she'd let me shower there and stuff. At one point, that ran out, and I was penniless. And I was in my studio, and I would always drink and do pills, and I always had guys dropping that off to me for free. And I'd reached the end of my rope. I was missing my wife. I was missing my children more than anything, my family my career, I virtually had nothing. I, my studio's above a Thai food restaurant on Santa Monica, and some guy down there, I don't even remember his name, Hung Well, Long Wang, I don't know what his name was, <laughs> enormous genitals, he would come up every day and just slip some Thai food in front of my door because he knew that I had nothing. And I never forgot that because he knew I was fucked up and still did something to try to make me okay. One night, I would always drink and do pills so I could stop crying. And I'd always get fucked up enough so at one point I would stop crying. 
And one day I had drunk myself and taken pills to the point where I, where I physically almost could not move, but the tears were still streaming down my face. And that's when I had reached what you would call the bottom or what I thought was the end of my life. And in a dramatic fashion, I reached in my drawer and I had my gun there. I grabbed a gun, I put it on the table, and I wrote a letter because I could not stand the pain anymore. I just could not stand what I had become and I had no reason to live. I wrote the whole letter, the gun was sitting there, and now here comes the part where it ends up sounding slightly comedic, but it's just the truth. My, my spiritual awakening was, as the tears were streaming down my face and I could barely walk, I said, it's, I'm gonna do it now, but before I do, I'm gonna go get a cookie from Lulu's Alibi, which was <laughs> the place across the street. And it was, it was a place I used to hang out, and, I, and all this beautiful moment, like if it were a movie, you could hear the music, you know? And all of a sudden, the, the idiot wrapped in a moron, which is me, goes, maybe I'll go get one more, one more cookie before I shoot myself. Okay, so I get up and I semi, like crawl down the steps, and I'm sta like barely moving across the way to get to Lulu's Alibi. Now, Lulu's Alibi was a place that is no longer, but it was a huge, sober, hangout for all the Ohio meetings and all the places and this woman had been sober for 18 years and everyone after the meeting would go there and they would you could always tell the addicts they were drinking water and chain smoking and so you, I was going across the street and I run into this man named Bob Timmons who was standing there and he looked at me and we knew each other and he saw all of my pain and he could tell because of his expertise, how close I was to the end. And he looked at me and said, Marco, what are you doing? And he opened his arms, and I started crying, and I collapsed in his arms. And when he brought me around again, I told him, and then he went up and he took the gun. And I, because I had no money, he made a phone call. And within four hours, I was on a plane going to Arizona. And if one could think that you, your life was saved by a cookie, it's an interesting <laughs> concept. But to me, that cookie was God. And, and I think that the one saving grace that I ended up having was in fact that. So I went there, I started doing all the work. I started talking about my dad. I started talking about all that stuff, my mother's denial, the stuffed pants, and all the things I'm telling you guys. And next thing you know, it's something kicked in where I started to believe that I could be better. Now, I had my moments. I'd sit around with all these happy people that were over-hugging. And you see, it, it's a scary thing to me because there was a lot of hugs, and I was trying to get used to all the sayings. Let go and let God, one day at a time. Don't step this, suck on that. They were just, it was like... <laughs> Constant, constant affirmations that I was, I don't want to hear that crap. But you know something, somebody, somebody came to me and said, you know something, that knowing the words is not the same as living the message. And to me, that's what became the most important thing. They said, one grain of sand at a time. But I was only used to getting a whole bucket. But next thing you say, just trust it. And I started to just say, okay, I've got no, I got no, like Bob Dylan, you ain't got nothing, you got nothing to lose. And next thing you know, that one grain became a teaspoon, became a cup, became a pint, became a gallon, be, became a bucket. And, and, and now I'm 13 years sober because I decided to believe. I decided to let go and actually believe in something besides myself because that's all I ever really cared about. Whatever the higher power might be. It could be a guy with a, with a beard, God of your choice. It makes no difference. I knew it was something bigger than me, and I started to believe, and I started to get the tools. So, as a songwriter, I thought, oh my God, now I'm sober. I'm going to be a Republican. I thought <laughs> my life was over with. I thought, oh, God, oh no, the Reagan years. I'm never going to write a song again. I'm never going to do this again. And you know something? I trusted that too. And my career turned around completely. And I became successful because I was coherent. Because I could look at my art and still be, as, as I stand before you, I'm just as colorful and as excited as I was when I was fucked up. It's just that now I'm straight. And I'm fucked up, but in, in a different way, in a colorful, <laughs> happy way. Okay, now I know I'm winding down, and, I, and, and, and I'll, I'll give you what the... I'm sorry, Robert, I have to tell this, because you heard it at the other meeting. 
this thing sort of happened to me. And now that we all sort of like know each other, or just at least a little bit, I got to tell you this thing that sort of happened. So here I am still cosmically trying to do everything that I possibly can to stay sober, and I'll try anything new. Mark, stand over there, and I will. Mark, go. Now I'm trusting it all. Well, there was this girl that I was dating who dumped me on New Year's Day, which was never the nicest thing to have happen. But well, I was in England doing this thing, and she said to me, if you're going to stay with me, you're going to have to do this. And it's a thing called, like, cosmic chiropractor. And, and I figured, I never heard of that in my life. And she goes, just go. It's, your, your inner child is going to come out. And say, okay, great. <laughs> So I go, and I, and I go to this place, and I'm sitting down in this thing, and, and you fill out stuff. I'm an alcoholic, I'm a drug addict, I'm a sex addict, I'm every ick that could be written down. I was left by my father, the clock, all the stories, the stuffed pants. I wrote down the entire history. And, and in comes, and there's like six tables there with people in the room. You're not by yourself. And you're always wearing your clothes. And in comes this girl who was kind of cute. She kind of had a yoga, a yoga body with a ghetto onion. She was kind of like, and, and she was the woman. Okay. So when she comes in, I kind of look at her, and I thought for a second she might have had a mustache, but the lighting wasn't good. And so, so she goes, hello, Marco. She reads my chart and goes, "Go, you know, people are laying down front first. So I lay down on the table. So if, if this is a table now, and your head goes in that thing with the Kleenex. So this, my head's like this, like just waiting. And I'm, I don't know what to expect. I only know that I'm going to save my relationship with this girl who dumped me anyway if I do the cosmic chiropractor. Okay, so this girl walks up behind me, and she reads my chart. She goes, okay, well, let's get started, shall we? And all of a sudden, like, on my neck, she goes, wah. <laughs> and, and, you know, she didn't reach, and you know, there was no rub or deep kneading. She, and she went like, yeah, wah, wah. <laughs> and, and she's, like, making these noises and barely touching me. She now, I, I have my head in the thing, and I'm going, this is really fucked. I, but I, I, I got to go through with it, because it might save the relationship. And she, okay, so I'm going, okay, the, uh, I'm going to have to lie and say that this worked and blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden, here comes the kicker. Then all of a sudden, I, I feel this thing. And her, her, her finger pokes my ass. And, and at that point, I actually went, hey, uh, uh. and I'm thinking, she didn't read the chart, the sex addict part. She, and, and then I thought, I thought maybe she just misfired on one of her, Whoa, yeah. she might have just poked down, the, poked down the wrong crevice. I didn't know. So I figured, okay, it's just, it's just an accident. And I'm still sitting there kind of a little bit fearful. And then all of a sudden, uh, uh. And, and she did it again. Then I started to go, hey, this is no, this is no accident. She's actually poking my dot. And, and she started, and next thing you know, after, I, I, and I just can be, because we have to be honest, after about the fifth poke, I started to enjoy it. <laughs> I'm sorry. And, <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you see, but 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 the but the thing is, is that I, I'm thinking to my I'm thinking to myself. When you say you know let go and let go, uh, here I was trying another thing, knowing that it was wrong. And quite honestly, we won't to say why, but I was afraid to turn over, if you know what I mean. And she goes, "All right, Marco, turn over." And I went, "I don't think so. I don't. I'm not sure this is a good idea." And and the weird part about it was there was like other people in the room. Now, okay, if, if, if I can tie this up for the ending of, of my share, the thing is, you know, the old Marco w actually wouldn't have had that look of fear. I would have been uh, poked in my blue knitted once or twice, and then I would have gone like, hey, baby, how about that? And I would have turned over whether she wanted me to or not, because the ism of this disease that we all have, you know, the alcoholism, I don't worry about taking a drink. I don't worry about doing a drug, but the isms of it still are with me every fucking day, from road rage to the way that I treat people to the way that I think I'm being treated. And there I was on the table, in, in oh, oh, land, and I was thinking to myself that the old me, that the drunk me, would have either gotten pissed off about it or I would have acted out upon it. But, but the sober me will not let that happen because, because of God and this program and rooms like that are filled with you guys out there makes the biggest difference in the world to me. I became obsessed with The Wizard of Oz. 
directed the play three times. I got to be the lion once on stage with the original witch. <laughs> and it was great. Well, and, and I became obsessed with it. But there's a line in the play that I will share with you as I close. Never made it to the movie, but to me, I apply this to my disease every day. I say it to myself at least three times a day. And it's in the play that was written in 1908 by Frank Elbaum. And he gives the lion the courage and the brain and the, everyone gets their stuff. And Dorothy is sitting there and she goes, well, I don't think there's anything in that bag for me. And he points to the balloon. And she looks at him and goes, well, God, Mr. Wizard, are, are you sure that balloon can get me all the way back to Kansas? And the wizard looks at her with these knowing eyes and say, well, Dorothy, you don't know if anything works until afterwards. Whoa. You don't know if anything works until afterwards. So keep trying. Keep flying. Stay where we're supposed to stay. Believe in this. The newcomers. I'm a living proof that a fucked up guy can stay sober. Yeah, and the old guys. I got 13 years now, so now I'm as old and as Republican as the guys that have time. I'm sort of like floating in the middle. I can't do it without being here with you guys, all of you. Without that, I'm a fucking dead man. And I don't want you guys to die. Don't die on me. Stay with it. Pick up a phone, look at each other, believe in something. Because if you do that, you're going to win. And I'll tell you, if you stay sober for 13 years, I'll take you all out for a call. <laughs> we'll go together. Thank you. God bless. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to thank Anthony for reading Chapter 5. And I would like to thank Sherry for reading the 12 Traditions. Are there any secretary's announcements? OK. Robert Alcoholic. Hi, Robert. Hi. Thanks, Mark. Please join me in thanking Mark for speaking tonight. And let's thank Gina for leading a great meeting. Thank you. Our newcomers out of towners, people who took chips and cakes, were uh, Michael. 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 Uh, newcomers: Richard, Sean, Glenn, Sierra, Bobby, Rudy, Tom, Eddie, Andy, and Nate. You're all most welcome. Out of towners: um, Dave from Seattle. No, Nate. 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 Oh, my bad. I beg okay, your pardon. And Steve from New York. All right, got that. One. Chips, 30 days. Julie. Rick. Sean and Nina. Six months. Steve, Paris, and Dominic. I miss Richard. And that is what they've done for eight years. If you have a court card that needs <coughs> signing, look for one of us after the meeting. We'll be up here by the podium. Um, there's several orders of business tonight, so in order that we can get to them, perhaps we should just thank all of the people who have commitments at this meeting and clap without introducing. We all know who we are and we'll be here next week. So let's thank everyone who has a commitment. Save for those who have announcements, so if you could stand and share with us, that would be nice. Paris. Gary. Hey, hey, hey. 
Um, H&I is an area of Alcoholics Anonymous. We help bring literature and panels in places where people can't get out. Rehabs, you know, we, we've all, we know. I can get out. And if you're laughing, <laughs> not the jails. And if you're laughing, please give generously. <laughs> Uh, would you, please. <laughs> Robert. Hey. I'm an alcoholic named Dave. Hi, Dave. I record this meeting. If you'd like a CD of uh, tonight's talk, come see me afterwards. I'll have one next week. And I also have uh, the previous weeks um, that were recorded and many others. Thank you. Um, another thing is we're hoping to update our coffee system here, so we'll talk with uh, Treasury about if we have some dough to get bigger urns because it kind of feels like we're trying to piecemeal. It's more like the coffee for a smaller meeting. Will the people who attend the, the 5.30, thank you, by the way. Will the people who attend the 5.30 meeting raise your hands? OK. Um, and I'd like to make it to that meeting as well sometimes. There's a, an issue that's come up with seat saving, and most people aren't really able to get seats. It seems like they're all saved by the time people start arriving for this meeting. So. Um, could we uh, have a group conscience? I would uh, make a motion if someone wants to second it. Second. Uh, the motion... <laughs> <laughs> Clearly we've been talking. <laughs> the motion would be that in, in order to get, because it really has gotten kind of out of control, it just seems like a lot of people get here with time to get a seat and all the seats are taken mysteriously somehow. I know this tends to happen at meetings, but just to kind of, uh, well, let's see who says yay or nay. The idea of eliminating this seat saving process that it's first come, first served for seats at this 8 p.m. Wednesday meeting. All in favor, please raise your hand. I believe that, um, I, I know a lot of people have their hands up now, and uh, I can't believe that I, as insane as I am, I'm actually looking at all of you guys trying to manage all of the egos and things that are coming up now about behind these seats. So why don't we just try to deal with this one step uh, at a time. There's uh, probably about anywhere from 15 to 20 commitments, which could all just be one side of the room. We're still talking about the mainstay of the room, and so that some people who are newcomers, and also people who have been here since this meeting started, if we all come in on an even keel, and the people who come here early enough to get a seat, just like a lot of meetings are that aren't those big meetings where all of a sudden there's never a seat and the newcomers are asked out because everybody else is doing this and the people who helped build the meeting and show up in time to get a seat can't get a seat. It's, uh, I'm sorry, Orion, you, had, you have something to share. I'm codependent, go ahead. Hi, Orion. There's, there's, there's validity to that. I don't really feel like this is a town hall meeting, ma'am. What? <laughs> but I, I, I think you're right, Orion. I'll manage everyone's feelings. Last thing, go ahead. I'm sorry. Who are you? Yeah, back to basics. Thank you, dear. Right. That's kind of where we're going to do this vote. All in favor of not having seat saving, aside from those who have, keep, hold, and uh, continue their commitments, all in favor of no seat saving to be enforced as of next Wednesday, now I'm a parole officer, please raise their hands in the yay position. Okay. I'm still going to count. Please keep your hands up.
That's 73. All not in favor? One, two. I, I, now my visual acuity could be off. Let me, let me check here. One, two, three, four, five, six. I'm sorry, we're doing a vote right now. Love you. <laughs> there is no more seat saving at this meeting until you arrive in just a minute. So that motion has gone through and is now done. Are there any other AA-related announcements, questions we do after the meeting, announcements we have during, I believe? Robert, uh, if anybody else I'm sorry, who are you? I'm Ted. Ted uh, That's what I thought. Uh, if anybody else needs a seat, there's 34 other meetings in this facility. <laughs> it's amazing that we all get along just well enough. Because this is like, and I'm the, I'm the main monkey sometimes. This is like 200 monkeys fucking a football. <laughs> I want to thank you guys. This is such a great commitment for me. I think we're doing a good job. We just got to communicate and clean up once in a while. <clears throat> we don't have time for any more mouse since we have run out of time. I would like to turn the meeting back over to Gina. Thank you for letting me be of service. It was so much easier than I could have imagined. This has been a regular Wednesday night speaker meeting. Thank you for coming and keep coming back. Now, after a moment of silent meditation for the alcoholic who still suffers, would Ryan, would you lead us on the prayer out? Thank you.